and uh, good morning or good evening to uh, to you. Uh, this is the 12th edition of Aztec on Air, and we're happy to to have you with us. As you know, Aztec on Air is our opportunity as Aztec to bring to our members and to the professionals in our field some special views from experts that are not necessarily uh, so familiar with us, but whose expertise and, and when work should inspire uh, what we do in our daily practices. And so today, maybe more than ever, and because we, we are going to talk philosophy today, and that is probably the, uh, the first time we'll do that on Aztec on Air. And uh, hopefully at the end uh, of this conversation, uh, you will all agree with me that the field of science and philosophy, and particularly in science, and uh, may not be that far apart as, as we think they are. But uh, to do that, I have the chance to have with me Professor Bob Frodman uh, from the University of North Texas. Uh, he is known as a field philosopher, and you can see that on the screen. Uh, and we're going to see what that means. But above all, and to start with, thanks to uh, to join us today for joining us today, Bob. Uh, tell us a little bit about about yourself, and and I, I do that all the time. I like people to to tell who they are and how they get uh, where they are. And in particular, this is something that I've um, so been struggling with over the last days preparing this is when, when we ask kids what they want to do, you know, they, they say we can be a firefighter or we can be a policeman or a football player or maybe a doctor or whatever it's are. But rarely they will say I will be a philosopher. When does that start? How does that work? Uh, for me, thank you, Walter. Uh, it's a pleasure being here. Uh, for me, it, it started when I was 13 or 14 years old, and my father ran a bowling alley in St. Louis, Missouri, and, and I helped him. I worked there. Um, and if you run a bowling alley, you have a lot of time to think and to talk, and we would have conversations, wide-ranging conversations. My father um, was not a well-educated man, but he always called what we did philosophizing, uh, and so... Uh, I went to the university uh, at 18 years, uh, 18 years old, and I thought that I was something of a philosopher already. I was quickly, uh, um, what, disabused of my assumptions, but somehow I've stuck with it over the years. So, so maybe that's at this point we, we should say, do you have a definition of philosophy then, or that is your own, or that do you use the regular one, or how, how does this work? Do, we, do you have a special yeah, view? Of how you do? I think philosophy is basically about coloring outside the lines. It's when, when thinking is not bounded, when you follow a thought wherever it leads, um, then you're doing philosophy. It's unbounded thinking. And then you take any problem today. You take climate change, for instance. Right? If you think about climate change, you might start, wherever you start, you end up at some point in economics, at some point in science, politics, ethics, and values. Mm -hmm. All crossing over all these areas, for me, is what philosophy is about. Mm -hmm. and, and we will come back to that, of course, a little bit later, because that's a, that's a big, big issue in science and just how to tackle these kind of issues, global issues, especially climate change, and, but others as well. But <clears throat> In another interview that I saw uh, from you, because I do some homework in preparation of this, I, he I heard you say, philosophy is about simple things in life. Not simplistic, but simple things in life, but profound things. That was your definition of philosophy in that interview. So, and that you would have questions that try to address these simple things of life. Is that f fair to say it that way? Absolutely, sure. Uh, philosophy is really the why should we care question, or what difference does this make, right? The question of significance. Mm -hmm. um, are, you could call, you could use fancy language and call these questions of ethics and values. That's good language. But it is more simply, you tell someone something about climate change and, and they want to say, hey, I live in Cleveland. Mm -hmm. Why should I care? Mm -hmm. What difference does this make to me and the people that I love? Mm -hmm. um, th that's, that's a simple question. It's also a profound question. Mm -hmm. It's probably also the first and last question that we ask. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you never, when you teach, but you, you teach philosophy, right? Yeah. You never speak about wealth anschauung? 
<laughs> Sometimes I use the 25%, uh, the 25 cent language, yes. You've got to roll out the fundamental ontologies and, uh, and, and uh, the Zines Fraga and things like this. But, you know, uh, you should also be able to talk to people who, who um, inhabit bowling alleys. You should be able to, and this is part of the problem I have with philosophy uh, and why I've tried this coinage of field philosophy, taking philosophy out in the field, out in the world, is because philosophers should be able to talk to just folks. Exactly. And so, and again, that's something that we will probably go a bit deeper into a little bit later. But I brought up this, the point of the question as, as a central thing because in science centers, we do something similar in a, in a way you know, what we call inquiry-based learning, uh, we help people formulate questions about scientific phenomena. And we say, for example, you, you probably know this experiment, you have a tube, and in that tube you have a marble and a feather, and when you flip it, uh, they both fall, and of course the marble falls quicker, but then when you take the air out, it's a total different story. So what the conversation that you have with people is, you know, what do you think is going to happen? Uh, and why is that going to happen? And would it be different if the marble was bigger or if the feather was another color or something of that sort? So to help them formulate questions. But I would say that are not philosophical questions. How would the philosophical question look like in a context like that? Well, that's a, that's a difficult issue, Walter, uh, because I do think in a sense they are uh, philosophical questions. Um, th there is a technical aspect to science, right? But Keep in mind that people who are trained in science, well-trained, have a PhD. We forget that a PhD means a doctor of philosophy in biology, chemistry, physics, whatever. And, and I take that to mean that once you reach that level of training within science, you are asking fundamental and even simple questions. And you, you're asking these questions both because we have, we are curious animals but also because we have real problems to solve in the world and these experiments, abstract as they may be, eventually touch ground in dealing with real existential problems in real life. Mm -hmm. And so at, at that level the dividing line between science and philosophy becomes pretty diaphanous. Mm -hmm. as, as it used to be in the Middle Ages and, 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 and you know closer to us as well, where these disciplines were much closer to each other than they are today. Well, that's right, yeah. yeah. But let me put the point differently. Science, I think, is shot through with philosophy, or to use a different metaphor, it's like a, a, a loaf of bread, a loaf of raisin bread, where you have shot through the, the loaf of bread raisins, right? I guess you could pick out the raisins, but it's part of the bread. Right? Yeah. Philosophy is part of any serious thinking about science. Mm. Yes, I get it. So, and, and I know, and to build a little bit on this question about museums that I just started, is that I know you have worked with the museum and, and, and even with the national parks in, in bringing in your, your, your point of view. So can you t give me an example or two or three practical things that you have contributed to, to what uh, museums have been doing thanks to your, to your participation? Sure, sure. And this is the, the great fun of of, of, as we say in English, where the rubber meets the road. When I was working with the National Park Service at Grand Canyon National Park, um, they, they have problems, right? They, they have challenges in terms of, um, uh, what, protecting this environment, but also enhancing the visitor experience. And so one of the problems that they have is that some trails are overused, some parking lots are totally full, right? And so one experiment we, uh, we conducted was designing a new trail, a new hiking trail at the Grand Canyon. Mm -hmm. All the trails mm -hmm. at the Grand Canyon are either at the rim, right at the rim, or they go down into the canyon. Um, we conceived of a trail that begins in the forest, way far away, a, a few, several miles from the canyon rim. But then ask the person through signages and stuff to imagine themselves being the first Spanish explorers oh, all right. this area, right? Mm -hmm. 
had no idea what they were going to wander across. We're just going through Ponderosa Pine Forest, and then suddenly something opened up to them, right? Mm -hmm. And so we, this was a way using history and aesthetics, right, to open up a different aspect of the visitor experience. Great. Well, okay, that's, that gives a more clear view of it, where, where we want to go later in the conversation. But before going that, let's come back a little bit to philosophy, because, you know, we have presented you as a field philosopher, so that means that you try to present yourself as different from the traditional uh, philosophers or philosophy as we know it today, as or we think we know. So, and uh, I, what I understand is that you are quite critical about the fact that philosophy is now limited or or prisoner into the academic world and that it should be actually the opposite of that am i right that's correct yes so can yeah. can you maybe a little bit elaborate on that yeah sure sure um i uh, i am a pluralist in my attitudes about these things i think what philosophers do these days in seminar rooms right or in professional, when they meet with their professional colleagues and they write professional papers, this is good work. This is all well and good. But, but, it must be complemented by philosophers leading, leaving the library and the study and going out in the world and not thinking about problems as, as we philosophers define them, but going out into the community, in the public sector, the private sector, stakeholders groups, and asking people how they define problems. And then seeking to make maybe small, maybe significant contributions to making these problems less bad. And so an important word here for us, because there's, there's a number of us who are working on this, field philosophy these days, the important word is ameliorating, to make things less bad. Right? You're not going to go fix the world's problems, but by thinking about ethics and values, by having an ethicist or an, an aesthetician as part of a conversation with scientists and economists and policymakers, can you contribute to alleviating problems? And so that's what we do. We go out into the world, out into the field. The field might be Brussels. It might be the European Commission. It sometimes is literally the field, like when we worked on a problem called acid mine drainage in southwestern Colorado for three years. Uh, so the field could be anything. It could be a science agency, right? It can be a museum. But the idea is to integrate ethics and values questions with STEM attitudes, STEM, STEM knowledge and attitudes, in order to enhance decision making. Yeah, I... I I was listening to you, and I, I saw this interview uh, before uh, yesterday about this similar topic, and it made me think. You, at some time, you even said, "I am not scared about the word bureaucracy because it would mean we can go in every institution as a philosopher and do make, move that needle a little bit there." And you used the example of the Queen Mary, and where you said, "You know, if the Queen Mary is on Big C, and you just would." change the needle like a little bit, like half a degree of its course, of mm -hmm. course in tomorrow it will not be a big change, but in 10 years it will be far away from this original destination. That's exactly what you were saying right now, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. So that's interesting. I know that, that you have worked with scientists and, and, and for already like 15 years maybe or, or maybe even more, and in particular you have a number of, of uh, programs done with the National Science Foundation. Can you tell us a little bit of your work as a field philosopher at, with the scientists? How is how is it come about? What what were the, the different steps? Well, actually, it, goes back, it goes back to 1993, so that's oh, yeah. so it's been even, more, even longer. Yeah, yeah, 20, 23 years actually, oh. and it began. Um, I uh, I finished my dissertation in philosophy in 1988. I taught for a couple of years. I got frustrated with philosophers who only want to talk to other philosophers, so I quit my job, my tenure-track job. I went back to school in geology, actually in climate science, and I got a master's in climate science, not because I wanted to become a scientist. Actually, at first, what I wanted to do was to write a, phil a philosophical account of the Grand Canyon. Now, I have yet to write that book um, <laughs> because... One day I got a call from the U.S. Geological Survey in 1993, 
and they said helped. They were trying, they produce, they produced and still produce high quality science. But is this high quality science relevant to constituencies? They asked for my help. And so actually they paid me as a consultant, but I probably learned more along these lines than I ever helped them. Think about how do you, about this translation procedure of taking insights, scientific insights, which are incredibly value, but how, valuable, but how do you entrain them within community conversations? And so another example comes from 2005 when Katrina hit New Orleans, right? Uh, the next day I called up uh, a program officer at the National Science Foundation and said, we have a case study. We have a case study in the failure of knowledge dissemination. Because if you're a hydrologist, if you're a, if you're a meteorologist, you knew this was going to happen. But the people in New Orleans acted like they were caught by surprise. Right? This was known information. So we have a breakdown between the production of knowledge and its consumption by the larger world. And the National Science Foundation gave me $60,000, and I went down to New Orleans. I pulled together people from 30 different disciplines, from public relations to economics to FEMA, Federal Emergency Management Agency, right, to hydrologists, you name it. We had jazz musicians, we had philosophers, and we had a three-day conversation about how can we better disseminate insights to audiences. What we deal with every day, actually, in our museums. <laughs> Absolutely, you do. Every day you work, guys work on this. Yeah. So I was, I was going to ask, uh, there is a, one point in that process where the notion of upstream engagement becomes relevant. And that means that even before the dissemination, you should involve the constituents into the research question, right? Absolutely. Because, yes. can you maybe give your view on that? Yeah, there, there's two things to say about that. Uh, a colleague of mine named Eric Fisher, whose work you might have run across, uh, talks about midstream modulation. Mm -hmm. That is to say, you can talk about this in terms of upstream, when you design the scientific research, midstream, when it's going on, do you want to involve stakeholders? And then downstream, when you get the results, right? Exactly. Yeah. And yes, it's important. But, but now, and this is the contribution that a philosopher, is an example of what a philosopher or a humanist might bring to the conversation, let us look at that metaphor. Streams only run in one direction. And, mm -hmm. and it already has this bias that who's at the top of the stream? It's the scientists or the knowledge producers. And so what you need something which is more cyclical, right, which is more iterative, where there's a continuing dialogue and co-production of knowledge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's, it's a question that we struggle with also. And I, 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 I like the fact that I never thought about this, that the stream always already goes in one direction. I, I will think about that in the future. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good point. So, uh, you have been then involved in a number of practical fields, philosophy exercises together with scientists to, to help uh, with, with concrete problems. You mentioned uh, Katrina, but that's not, you know, it, it's, it's a bit different. So, you've been involved very strongly in the, the climate change efforts. So, can you tell us a little bit more in detail what has been your role in uh, addressing climate change from your point of view? Well, um, yeah, we're talking about putting together a book of case studies. Uh, I have probably been involved with 15 or 20 different ones. Katrina was one. There was something, a project done in Chile, so southern Chile was another. We had a project called the Flatirons Outdoor Classroom, which was a K through 8 project. Um, if you talk about the climate change issues that I've worked on, um, this was direct. Whenever you talk about doing field philosophy, one of the first questions you have to ask is who is the audience? Or better said, who are your co participants? And so you have, there is no one size fits all audience, right? If it is, it's not a very targeted conversation. And so we have had experiments in field philosophy. Uh, at the grade school level, high school level, college, undergraduate, graduate, stakeholders groups, professional groups, uh, policymakers, the National Science Foundation. 
the climate change work we did for three years was in southwestern Colorado mm -hmm. uh, on the occasion of something called acid mine drainage, right? Mm -hmm. uh, which is a mining problem which led to larger climate change issues. And this was part of a, an, uh, an NSF grant, a quarter million dollar grant for what they call REUs. You may be familiar with this. That stands for a research experiment for undergraduates, REU. And I pitched to the National Science Foundation a different kind of REU. Typically, this is for science undergraduates who want to be work in a lab for the summer to see if they like it. Mm -hmm. The idea of this REU, in fact, I ran two of them, one on acid mine drainage and another on climate change, okay, up in Boulder at NCAR. Okay? Mm -hmm. In both cases, we said, this is six years of projects, you're going to do research in science, but also research on science. Mm -hmm. And so I had stipends for 12 students. I brought on board, I, I sent out application materials, I'd get 100 applicants for the 12 spots. Okay? Mm -hmm. uh, it was a good deal for kids. right? Mm -hmm. but we would shoot for four students in the natural sciences, four in the social sciences, and four in the humanities. And we would make this analysis of acid mine drainage, of climate change, we would make this into an interdisciplinary conversation. And not just interdisciplinary, not just between disciplines, but also a transdisciplinary conversation where we would invo invo involve stakeholders groups that are working on these problems on the ground. The same thing we did when we worked on fracking in Denton over the last few years. Mm -hmm. and, and can you say something about the outcomes? What is different? from the results that you obtain when you participate in something like that compared to when scientists alone do it? Now this is such a good question, you know, and, and in fact a great deal of our work has in the last three years, I'm finishing up a, a quarter million dollar grant from the, from the National Science Foundation, which you might call a philosophy of outcomes. Mm -hmm. Right? Or a philosophy, the word we use is, is impact. We've done a lot of work on NSF's broader impact criterion over the last 10 years and similar criteria in the EC and in China. Right? The question of impact is incredibly difficult. But let's first think about it in terms of science, right? Because science is the same challenge, doesn't it? You can count publications. You can talk about someone's H index, right? But to a certain extent, what we're talking about there is within the closed circle of other academics. Mm -hmm. How do scientists, how does the scientific community demonstrate a broader impact? Now, at the National Science Foundation, there's been a program funding this stuff. This is where I've gotten $700,000 funding over the last 10 years. It's called, you may know this, Walter, it's called the SICIP program. The science of science and innovation policy. And a lot of this is about economics. Well, show me that for every dollar of science that you get a dollar and a half of economic gain. The problem mm -hmm. with that, of course, is that impacts are not just economic. There's all, they're also ecological or environmental. They're also cultural, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you start then looking at these different kinds of impact, you then get driven into political and indeed philosophical questions. Mm -hmm. So the so, problem, the problem, one point more, the problem is not really limited to how you demonstrate the impact of philosophy. It is more a, a, a philosophy of how you demonstrate impact. And that gets devilishly difficult to, to, to defend for some cranky congressman. So, two comments on that. The first is that uh, working with NSF in the in formal science education, we know the notion of broader impacts as well, but, and I speak for me and not for my colleagues, so I may be wrong in this, but, I mean, it's so bizarre that the thing that you have been doing, from your point of view, doesn't seem to have crossed borders or, or disciplines or divisions into NSF to come to our field. So that's that's the first thing that I, I don't know if you have the same feeling that there is sort of a, 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 a gap in between the two the two areas, and I don't know why that is. Yeah, it's, it's a great point, Walter. In fact, we uh, we have a term for this phenomenon. We call it disciplinary capture. Mm -hmm. 
because what happens, it's like the old story about why the drunk was looking for his keys underneath the street lamp. It's where he could see, right? <laughs> and so what you find over and over again is that impact, broader impact. How do I, I, I teach 75 students a, a semester in two courses. Mm -hmm. I, I get emails sometimes from kids five or ten years later about how I've changed their life. Mm -hmm. Something they heard one day in a class, okay? Mm -hmm. How am I going to go demonstrate that at the end of the semester? They may hate me at the end of the semester. They may love me five years or five years later or vice versa, right? And so there's a tendency for all of this impact conversation to be like the drum, drunk underneath the street lamp. Mm -hmm. So we have to become pretty subtle in terms of how to think about broader impacts. I meant to send you a couple publications that we came out last year on this. I'll do it when we get offline. Mm -hmm. uh, but yes, basically this is a research area. This is an area that all of us need to think a lot about. How do you demonstrate, how do you have, how do you have impact? But then once you have it, how do you demonstrate it? So you have any kind of indication where, where you're going with your research in that? Well, yeah, uh, and what we have come up with, we published a piece in Nature, I think it was in 2013, where we identify f 56 indicators of impact. Mm -hmm. Now, this was a little bit tongue-in-cheek, because <laughs> whenever you identify 56 of something, you're, you know, you're, you're, you're kind of throwing everything at the wall and see what, sti what sticks, but that's part of the problem, right? Give me uh, two or three of the 56. Okay, I, I, I will. Um, we have been working on a pro the project's now over about for about a year. But for three years, we worked on fracking issues in Denton, which is Dallas, Texas. Uh, and we formed a Denton advisory group, mm -hmm. DAG, we called it. And we organized meetings where the community could show up and listen to experts from the oil and gas industry, environmentalists, policymakers, politicians. We created an open forum for conversation. Mm -hmm. Well, this got pe some people upset. And one of the results was that we received a call one day by the, from the university president's assistant asking for an immediate meeting. Now, you know, university presidents are very busy guys, right? <laughs> but we were drawn in, and it turned out that when he went to, to give a budget presentation on, on, um, um, on, on the, the state of the university, he had an hour with the Board of Regents. They spent 40 of it yelling at him about us. Now, these are representatives of the oil and gas industry who are on the boards of regions. This is Texas, after all, right? Uh -huh. Now, okay, we had an impact. Now, <laughs> a positive impact? Good question. Yeah. A negative impact? Yes. <laughs> Probably both, right? Yeah. But we, it, we upset somebody, and that was an indication of impact. Yeah, all right. So, uh, and I was going to go from there about, for, it's new for the scientists as well that you work with, right? Right. Uh, doing it. And how do they feel about that? They, they feel that you come on their terrain, that you take some of their power away or, 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 or not? Or is it just a good, a good mix? Well, um, my, my view of that question is a little jaundiced because um, first, I get so much better of a reaction from scientists, engineers, and policymakers than I do from philosophers. Basically, <laughs> philosophers hate what we do. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> they think that we are coming. <laughs> And frankly, I don't understand this. I say to them, why aren't we your best friend? We are going to defend what you do and explain what you do to the larger public. Mm -hmm. But I, we get a lot of abuse. Now, compared to the, the, the philosophy community, scientists welcome us with open arms. Now, of course, not everyone. Sure. But scientists these days, there's been a real evolution. If you look at this broader impacts criterion, it started at National Science Foundation in 1997. And there's been a real evolution. People hated it and fought it tooth and nail in 2000. But over the years, there's been a steadily growing accommodation. And so while, sure, there's people, some people that don't want to hear about this, a lot of people see what we do as 
helping them get on with their work and allowing them to both do good science and be more relevant to to the communities that support us. And so that's, that was going to be the, the last part of the conversation that I wanted to go. I have come to you by accident, I told you, and I, I feel a little bit ashamed that I didn't know about that before. But what I've observed was the evolution within the scientific community. Uh, and not at the same way and not at the same rate in different parts of the world, certainly more quick and, and more deep in Europe than it is in the US, where yes. there is this yes. will of having evidence-based decision-making and well, the, 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 the public and the policymakers to accept the result of scientific research and the proposals for solutions as the basis for whatever decision they make. And so I've seen that, and I thought that was extremely important for science centers and museums, for example, to, to, to recognize that the scientific community was changing in that regard. And, and, the yes. way. and then I thought that I, I see the problems that we have in science centers and museums just uh, addressing it from that point of view. And that's why I was so, so excited to hear about you, because I said, this is the missing link. How can we in the science center, or can we in the science centers, use this kind of approach and bring philosophy in the way that you describe together in the presentations that we do about these global issues. Would that make things easier for, for, for convincing the public and having them changing attitudes and taking action? Yeah, you know, we've got to give it a shot. Um, I, I, this is what we mean by field philosophy. Uh, not simply writing papers, 6,000 word papers on this. But uh, dealing with this on the ground, uh, at a specific um, e exhibit, uh, in a specific science museum, at a national park, with a stakeholders group, and seeing if you can ameliorate problems, right? If you can make things a little better and a little better, taking that Queen Mary and turning it one degree, mm -hmm. and then you know, one degree this year, one degree next year, and maybe over time you can make a difference. I see this as the next frontier, not only in, in science education, but also in philosophy education. Um, that's why I'm t in Texas. I went down there to, uh, to start a new PhD program as, as the chair of the department. I have had my successes and failures, but basically we want to train philosophers to work with science world in Vancouver or Exploratorium and in San Francisco or you name it, right? And all the other venues, not just science museums, the National Science Foundation, stakeholders groups, you name it. There should be philosophers, I'm not saying a lot of philosophers necessarily, <laughs> right? But if the Environmental Protection Agency, I think their work could be improved if if one half of one percent of their a kind of leavening in the bread of their cohort of their employees had some training in how to think about these issues, yeah, well maybe that's a, that's a good point to stop here, and I I hope that that our colleagues who have been watching this have got like some kind of of new uh, insight in how they could address these these issues and bring bring uh, philosophers in uh, from now on and, and looking at these problems. <laughs> Do you want to add something? And do you think that something that you couldn't say that you would like to share with us about? Uh, well, I would really add that if anybody sees this, and anybody um, wants help with a project, we're always looking for new projects. And you can find me. My last name is Frodeman at unt.edu. I'm easy to find. Thank you Everyone so much. Easy to find. Google rules all, right? Oh yeah, of course it does. Thank you so much, and, and, and hope this is not the last time that we can talk about all this. Thank you, Walter. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Bye.